If you haven't heard of Project 2025, this is going to be something to keep an eye on. I just came across this information last night, but wanted to give a quick update on what I found as this information has a direct bearing on Bible prophecy and the enforcement of Sunday legislation as the Mark of the Beast. If you aren't familiar with why the Mark of the Beast ties into Sunday legislation, I would recommend watching our three-part documentary series, Unmasking the Mark, which goes into a lot more detail showing how the Bible itself reveals what the Mark of the Beast is and why. You can find a link for this series in the description below or go to unmaskingthemark.com. So let's talk about Project 2025. Wikipedia gives a fairly good overview, saying Project 2025 is a far-right plan to purge and reshape the U.S. federal government in the event of a Republican victory in the 2024 United States presidential election. The plan involves various restructuring of government agencies and personnel, with the stated objective being to reverse the woke agenda of the current administration and restore more liberties to the American people. The project's website is project2025.org, and it states it is not enough for conservatives to win elections. If we are going to rescue the country from the grip of the radical left, we need both a governing agenda and the right people in place, ready to carry this agenda out on day one of the next conservative administration. This is the goal of the 2025 Presidential Transition Project. The project will build on four pillars that will collectively pave the way for an effective conservative administration. Here is MSNBC's report on Project 2025. Crackpots, insurrectionists, and weekend terrorists are laying the groundwork to turn our government into a Trumpist nightmare if the former president somehow manages to get back into the White House in 2024. The AP reports on the plan laid out by a Project 2025, a government in waiting for Trump's return. Quote, the idea is to have the civic infrastructure in place on day one to commandeer, reshape, and do away with what Republicans deride as the deep state, firing as many as 50,000 federal workers. The goal is to oust employees they believe are standing in the way of the president's agenda and replacing them with like-minded individuals. That should sound familiar since it's directly linked to Donald Trump's authoritarian plans overall. New York Times reported in July that Trump and his associates have a broader goal to alter the balance of power by increasing the president's authority over every part of the federal government that now operates by either law or tradition with any measure of independence from political interference by the White House. Numerous former Trump officials are involved with Project 2025. And look, it's not some shadowy behind the scenes effort. It's been open about its plans to gut worker protections and dismantle environmental protections. It includes their plans to make pushing right-wing Christianity the federal government's job. It's all in there, in the nearly thousand-page playbook calling on the next president to maintain a, quote, biblically-based, socially science, social science-reinforced definition of marriage and family. As Guthrie Grace Fitzsimmons writes for MSNBC, concerns about policies of this kind aren't only about the possible return of Donald Trump to office. This is about the next Republican president, whoever it may be is going to be pushing Christian nationalism. So Project 2025 includes a long list of policy change recommendations for a conservative president should one come to the White House in January of 2025. The details of the plan are defined and explained in Project 2025's document titled Mandate for Leadership, the Conservative Promise, which is over 900 pages. It is broken into five sections, each of them dealing with how to restructure and improve the various government agencies and departments. But the one I want to focus on is the portion dealing with the Department of Labor and Related Agencies, written by Jonathan Berry. This portion of the mandate talks about policies and plans with regard to employees and employers and families and income structures. But of particular interest are the policies regarding Sabbath rest on page 589. Now remember, of course, when they use the word Sabbath, they are referring to Sunday, and you will see they define it as such in this document. I will read the policy and then share a few comments. The policy states, Sabbath rest. God ordained the Sabbath as a day of rest, and until very recently, the Judeo-Christian tradition sought to honor that mandate by moral and legal regulation of work on that day. 
Moreover, a shared day off makes it possible for families and communities to enjoy time off together, rather than as atomized individuals, and provides a healthier cadence of life for everyone. Unfortunately, that communal day of rest has eroded under the pressures of consumerism and secularism, especially for low-income workers. So they clearly stated the problem and the desire to restore Sunday as a communal day of rest. Now they are going to state how they propose to accomplish this. Congress should encourage communal rest by amending the Fair Labor Standards Act, FLSA, to require that workers be paid time and a half for hours worked on the Sabbath. That day would default to Sunday, except for employers with a sincere religious observance of a Sabbath at a different time. Example, Friday sundown to Saturday sundown. The obligation would transfer to that period instead. Houses of worship, to the limited extent they may have FLSA covered employees, and employers legally required to operate around the clock, such as hospitals and first responders, would be exempt, as would workers otherwise exempt from overtime. So not employees, but employers or businesses who have a sincere religious observance of a different Sabbath than Sunday, like Saturday for example, would be required to pay time and a half to employees that work on that day. But as those who keep the Sabbath, we know that God prohibits work on the seventh day. While this policy could encourage workers to desire to work on that day because they would get paid more, it would discourage employers from having employees work on that day. There is still some discussion whether this would accomplish their desired result of everyone or mostly everyone having a communal day of rest on Sunday, but they go on to explain more. Alternative view. While some conservatives believe that the government should encourage certain religious observance by making it more expensive for employers and consumers not to partake in those observances, other conservatives believe that the government's role is to protect the free exercise of a religion by eliminating barriers as opposed to erecting them, whereas imposing overtime rules on the Sabbath would lead to higher costs and limited access to goods and services, and reduce work available on the Sabbath, while also incentivizing some people through higher wages to desire to work on the Sabbath. The proper role of government in helping to enable individuals to practice their religion is to reduce barriers to work options and to fruitful employer and employee relations. The result? Ample job options that do not require work on the Sabbath so that individuals in roles that sometimes do require Sabbath work are empowered to negotiate directly with their employer to achieve their desired schedule. So the general idea here is to use a policy compelling employers to pay those who work on Sunday overtime wages in order to incentivize those employers to give their employees that day off, thereby influencing businesses not to open on Sunday or to minimize their operations on that day. While this may not seem like a significant push towards Sunday legislation, I would argue that it is, and here is why. In the past 15 or so years that I have been aware that the Mark of the Beast will involve the enforcement of Sunday legislation, there have been individuals that have promoted Sunday laws or blue laws online in commentary articles, and there have even been some organizations like European Sunday Alliance or the Lord's Day Alliance that have worked to promote Sunday rest. But these efforts have largely all been from the private sector or from organizations or churches outside of government agencies. They are influential agencies, but here in this Project 2025 Mandate for Leadership, we see a concrete plan written up for governmental policy changes for the next conservative president. This is not an article promoting Sunday observance in some periodical piece, nor is this a plea for Sunday observance by a church or religious organization, but this is a carefully crafted policy to put laws into place that would incentivize a common day of rest on Sunday. This portion of the mandate for leadership with regard to the Department of Labor was written by Jonathan Berry, whose profile on the Federalist Society website says Jonathan Berry provides strategic counsel and litigates on issues at the intersection of law, politics, and public policy. 
They add, in government, Mr. Berry headed the regulatory office at the U.S. Department of Labor, where he oversaw the development process of dozens of proposed and final rules. As the regulatory policy officer, he regularly represented the department to the executive office of the president and the office of management and budget. So he worked at the Department of Labor, overseeing the development of legal policies and represented the Department of Labor to the executive office of the president. So this is not just somebody with an idea to promote Sunday as a day of rest, but someone who actually has the capacity to do so and make the recommendation to the president. Here's what Jonathan, who is now a managing partner at Boyden Gray & Associates, a public policy firm, had to say about these Sabbath policies in a recent interview. But there, there are implications for social conservative values across many issues. Uh, one of the interesting proposals um, that, that you've laid out in, in Project 2025 Handbook from Heritage is uh, stuff around the Sabbath. Mm -hmm. what, what, what are some of the ideas that you have there? Yes. Um, so uh, this is, it sounds, it sounds controversial. Mm -hmm. um, uh, in many respects, it is, a, it is a return to something that basically always everyone ever had mm -hmm. um uh and it, it's specifically the idea of um encouraging sabbath rest um through discouraging commerce mm -hmm. um on on the sabbath um the 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 proposal that's in our book mm -hmm. is uh, amending the the basic federal overtime law fair labor standards mm -hmm. act to require that overtime be paid uh for all work uh, done on the Sabbath. Um, oh, interesting. Yes. Yeah. Um, so I don't think um, uh, I, I don't think I don't think Congress has um, the authority to mandate uh, like a national closing uh, mm -hmm. on on the Sabbath. This was that was always a a state decision mm -hmm. um, to do that. But I, let me add, it was always a state decision mm -hmm. to, to do that. They did um, it, <laughs> and, and yeah, I'm not uh, you know I'm not saying this practice was uniform, homogenous, uh, whatever, but um, very, very widely spread. And only only recently in the last um, few decades um, have uh, have most states moved moved away from this. Um, so this is um, I think this is about as far as the federal government could could properly go mm -hmm. in this space. Um, but it would be an encouragement and inducement um, uh, to um, to to rest, but really to kind of coordinate commercial activity for the other six days mm -hmm. uh, of, of the week, which mm -hmm. is as for as uh, as long as we've had mm -hmm. Sabbatarian uh, civilization, mm -hmm. you know, beginning like beginning in Israel and continuing into Christendom. Mm -hmm. um, this is something that's been increasingly a part of the rhythm of civic life. Mm -hmm. uh, most importantly, for people to have space to worship and honor God um, and and secondly, to have times of communal rest uh, with their families and with their communities. I find it interesting. He said, I don't think Congress has the authority to mandate a national closing. I find that interesting because Congress has ruled in the past that it does have the authority to mandate a national closing when it is for secular reasons. Here is what we read from Cornell Law School's website regarding the constitutionality of Sunday closing laws. The history of Sunday closing laws goes back to the United States colonial history and far back into English history. Commonly, the laws require the observance of the Christian Sabbath as a day of rest, although in recent years they have tended to become honeycombed with exceptions. The Supreme Court rejected an Establishment Clause challenge to Sunday closing laws in McGowan v. Maryland. The court acknowledged that historically, the laws had a religious motivation and were designed to effectuate concepts of Christian theology. However, in light of the evolution of our Sunday closing laws through the centuries, and of their more or less recent emphasis upon secular considerations, it is not difficult to discern that as presently written and administered, most of them, at least, are of a secular rather than of a religious character and that presently they bear no relationship to establishment of religion. The fact that this prescribed day of rest is Sunday, a day of particular significance for the dominant Christian sects 
does not bar the state from achieving its secular goals. So, in fact, Congress has ruled in the past that the enforcement of Sunday laws are constitutional when they are enacted for secular purposes, not realizing, of course, that by so doing, Satan will be gathering the entire world under his banner, which is the day he claims to be a day of reverence and worship to him in the place of God's seventh-day Sabbath, which God has claimed to be a sign of allegiance to him, saying, And hallow my Sabbaths, and they shall be a sign between me and you, that ye may know that I am the Lord your God. It is not without significance that these policies concerning overtime pay for workers on Sunday comes from the Department of Labor, as the civil institution driving Sunday laws in the past also came from the labor unions. In 1888, in the 50th Congress, Senator Blair proposed a Sunday rest bill. At that time, a periodical, the American Sentinel, had published the following concerning this bill. Five million signatures to a petition to Congress for laws promoting a better observance of Sunday have now been obtained. The National Women's Christian Temperance Union Convention have voted to make the advancement of this petition a special and urgent work. The most influential endorsement which the petition against Sunday work in the mail and military service and in interstate commerce has yet received was given unanimously and enthusiastically on October 18th at Richmond, Virginia by the International Convention of the Brotherhood of Locomotive Engineers after two hours thorough consideration of the subject under the lead of the editor of our Department of Church Work. Let all labor organizations, large and small, and all churches do likewise speedily, and the desired law will not be long in coming. Churches and labor unions combined are politically irresistible. But let it be borne in mind that when churches become politically irresistible, they are spiritually powerless, for they never seek political strength until they become conscious of diminishing moral force. Today, the Christian churches throughout our land are very conscious of their diminishing moral force, lamenting the lack of church attendance and lack of influence for moral reform in the Western world. As such, it would only be natural for the religious right to turn to the state to enact legislation enforcing the observance of religious institutions, like their communal day of rest on Sunday. And as it was said previously, that churches and labor unions combined are politically irresistible, so too it will be the case today. In 1888, a newspaper from Chicago called the Union Signal commented on the proposed Sunday legislation. Labor unions are now united with the churches in demanding such legislation. Our wheelbarrow government never does anything without pushing. But with the churches pushing with all their might at one handle of the wheelbarrow, and the labor unions doing the same at the other, it must move and carry its load, Sunday observance along with it. When Pilate and Herod were made friends, Christ had to be crucified. And that is where we see Sunday legislation leading, the uniting of church and state coming together to persecute God's people by enforcing legislation that would cause them to disregard or even to break God's law. Perhaps right now it doesn't seem to Mr. Berry or others that the federal government could properly go so far as to mandate a national closing on Sunday, but things will change. One of the biggest complaints liberals have about Project 2025 is its lack of legislation to curb climate change. Plans to gut worker protections and dismantle environmental protections. The Guardian called Project 2025 a plan to dismantle U.S. climate policy for the next Republican president. But should the liberal agenda decide to adopt a day of rest to further their climate agenda, Sunday observance would have all the secular might it needs to drive a national day of rest bill right through Congress without a problem, for both Democrats and Republicans would wholeheartedly embrace it. Today, the Sunday movement is advancing stealthily, making known its intentions. Ellen White wrote about the Sunday movement, saying, the Sunday movement is now making its way in darkness. The leaders are concealing the true issue, and many who unite in the movement do not themselves see whither the undercurrent is tending. Its professions are mild and apparently Christian, but when it shall speak, 
it will reveal the spirit of the dragon. So is Jonathan Berry or those driving Project 2025 concealing the true purpose of this legislation, downplaying its severity and potential to restrict liberty of conscience? Or does he himself not know where this communal day of rest will lead? I do not know his motives, but I do know the real issues of the conflict need to be brought to his attention and to the attention of those who are trying to drive forward this legislation. Ellen White concluded, it is our duty to do all in our power to avert the threatened danger. We should endeavor to disarm prejudice by placing ourselves in a proper light before the people. We should bring before them the real question at issue, thus interposing the most effectual protest against measures to restrict liberty of conscience. We should search the scriptures and be able to give the reason for our faith, says the prophet, the wicked shall do wickedly, and none of the wicked shall understand, but the wise shall understand. One of the reasons this Mandate for Leadership document has such strong potential to become the working policy of the next conservative president is because of the influence and power of the Heritage Foundation, who is behind Project 2025. What is the Heritage Foundation? They describe themselves as a research and educational institution whose mission is to build and promote conservative public policies based in Washington, D.C. From the streets of America to the halls of Congress, the radical left and the rising tide of socialism pose a dire threat to America's future. More than ever, our families, our communities, all Americans need a champion fighting for them against the left's agenda. That's what we do every day at the Heritage Foundation. We fight for America. Every day we are advancing individual liberty, limited government, free enterprise, traditional American values, and a strong national defense. When big issues confront America, our experts develop the solutions from creating more jobs and improving the economy to securing our borders and making health care more affordable. Our focus isn't on putting more power into the hands of government. It's on returning power to the citizens. We don't work on behalf of any special interest or political party. Our commitment is to the American people. But we know we cannot do this alone. It's because of our friends and allies like you that we have the ability to engage on all these fronts. We know there's too much at stake to watch from the sidelines. It takes all of us to fight for America. That's why working together and united in our vision of a better future for all Americans, we will succeed. At this point, I want to look at Paul Dans, who is the Heritage Foundation's director for the Presidential Transition Project, which is responsible for Project 2025. I just want you to hear the first couple of minutes of his introductory speech and the promo video they played for Project 2025 detailing its plan and purpose. What is Project 2025? It is everyone here. This is the movement. We are going to be prepared day one, January 20, 2025, to hit the ground running as, a, as conservatives to really help the next president. Heritage has Heritage got on the book, on the marker, as, as an organization by delivering the first mandate for leadership in 1980 to President-elect Reagan. We also, over time, gave a lot of resumes in, but when Dr. Roberts came aboard, he said, this task in 2024 is too big for any one think tank. This has to be a movement. And what we've done is use our convening power here at Heritage to bring the entire movement together. So 2025 is not a heritage thing, it's a conservative movement thing. We're gonna explain briefly here, we're gonna have a, a panel and we'll have a, a video, but what we're doing is systematically preparing to march into office and bring a new army of aligned, trained, and 
essentially weaponized conservatives ready to do battle against the deep state. So if you would, uh, join me in watching the video and inviting our fellow panelists here, Ed, Rick, and Ken Cuccinelli over. Uh, so we'll cue the video and, and have a little discussion. What is Project 2025? It's a call for you to come work here, Washington, D.C. Conservatives face a tough challenge in Washington, the swamp. The left has built a system that blocks and sabotages our efforts to run our government and deliver a conservative agenda. People would come into the government on behalf of a president and not be bought in to the agenda that he was elected to do. They were either uncommitted or incompetent. Things aren't going to change unless you commit to serving our country. We want to make sure that the plans that are in place have been vetted so that the person knows not only what argument and excuses come in their way, but what the answer is, and have the trust of a movement-wide effort led by the Heritage Foundation to make sure that they know that it's credible and it's conservative. This time, we have a secret weapon. This time, we have Project 2025. By learning from the experience of former conservative appointees, we can overcome common obstacles and get things done. The reason I got involved is because I wanted to be part of a movement-led effort and Heritage Foundation has used their influence to be able to convene the movement. We can be ready to hit the ground running on day one of the next administration. In the wise words of Morton Blackwell, you owe it to your philosophy to study how to win. Project 2025 will ensure a conservative agenda is ready to roll on day number one. Make sure that we as conservatives are prepared to hit the ground running January 20th, 2025. To learn more, go to project2025.org. Their plan then is to dramatically reform the government in the first 180 days, or six months of the new president's term. While the Heritage Foundation is organizing the effort, they are not working alone. They state Project 2025 is the effort of a massive coalition of conservative organizations that have come together to ensure a successful administration begins in January 2025. The advisory board includes a coalition of over 70 significant influential and conservative organizations, colleges, and other institutions. So this is not at all a politically insignificant movement. To the contrary, the Heritage Foundation has been successful in the past in implementing their policies. You heard Paul Dans, the director of Project 2025, say they delivered the first mandate for leadership to Ronald Reagan in 1980. But Reagan also adopted many of the policies crafted by the Heritage Foundation for his administration. Wikipedia states the Heritage Foundation, sometimes referred to simply as Heritage, is an activist American conservative think tank based in Washington, D.C. It took a leading role in the conservative movement during the presidency of Ronald Reagan, whose policies were taken from Heritage Foundation studies, including its mandate for leadership. In 1998, Slate Magazine, a news commentary publication, wrote, by all measures, Heritage has much to celebrate. From across the political spectrum, opinion appears to be unanimous that the organization has been singularly effective in accomplishing its mission of dragging American politics to the right. Since the 1980 release of its Mandate for Leadership, a detailed program for the incoming Reagan administration that the Reagan administration actually took seriously Heritage has played a central role in setting not only the broad conservative agenda, but also the details of legislation. It's crystal clear the Heritage Foundation does have a monumental influence and even a history of having their policies adopted by the president, as did Reagan in 1980. And that is why I think Project 2025 and this movement is worth mentioning and taking seriously. But things get even more interesting. The news outlet Politico had a bit more to say about the role of the Heritage Foundation's mandate for leadership in 1980. Paul Dans points to a massive book prominently displayed on a table in his Capitol Hill office, written, Dans says, in the sweaty summer of 1980. 
yellowing and torn at the edges, it is a 1,091-page manifesto of conservative governance titled A Mandate for Leadership. That book really became the Bible of the Reagan Revolution. That's kind of what we're working from, says Dans, a tall MIT-educated lawyer who is leading a team of former Trump officials preparing a new America First agenda for the next Republican president, whether it's former President Donald Trump or not. If you watched the first Republican presidential debate this week, there's no doubt you took note of the young, brash candidate with a big smile at the center of the stage, 38-year-old Vivek Ramaswamy. Vivek Ramaswamy, who is a young Republican presidential candidate, told the press about the revolution he wants to lead in America. Take a look. Above all, it's that the next generation is once again proud to be American, unapologetically so, reviving the dream of the American Revolution. And I'm only going to be able to do that if I'm the next president, leading a revolution like Reagan did in 1980. That's what I'm aiming to lead in 2024. So there you have it. Vivek Ramaswamy, who in many polls is now in second place for the conservative nomination just behind Trump, is aspiring to a revolution in America like former President Ronald Reagan, who took his policies from the Heritage Foundation's mandate for leadership that Paul Dans said became the Bible of the Reagan Revolution. The New York Post reported Vivek Ramaswamy aims to be another Reagan. This begs the question, how familiar is Ramaswamy with the Heritage Foundation? I'd say pretty familiar since the Heritage Foundation invited Vivek to discuss his new book last year in the fall of 2022. He has graced our stage before, and we're pleased to welcome him here again today. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Vivek to the stage. So all of this said, the question remains, will the Heritage Foundation's Project 2025 and its mandate for leadership which include legislation incentivizing a communal day of rest on Sunday be advanced in 2025 by the next conservative president, such as Donald Trump or Vivek Ramaswamy, who aims to lead the next Reagan revolution? I don't know, and time will tell. I'm not making any predictions, but what I am saying is that certainly Project 2025 and this mandate for leadership is something to keep an eye on. What we do know for certain is that prophecies in the Bible foretell that in America, a Christian movement would arise to power and influence the state to enforce Sunday rest as a sign of allegiance to earthly powers in opposition to the law of God, and that this point of controversy will fall on the issue of the fourth commandment, which plainly states, the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. The prophecy states, and the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. We do know that policies to incentivize a communal day of rest will eventually increase in severity, eventually turning into laws prohibiting those who don't observe the day from being able to buy or sell and ultimately, a law putting those who refuse to honor the day of the sun to death. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, which is apostate Protestantism, or what today is called Christian nationalism, that unites with the state government, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. This last war between Christ and Satan is often referred to as the Great Controversy. If you'd like to know more about this controversy and more intimate details concerning how these things will unfold, I highly recommend Volume 4 of the Great Controversy, which you can purchase from our website. And again, I recommend Unmasking the Mark as a documentary series worth watching that goes into more details about how these principles have come to clash and have been unfolding as a result of new policies and legislation that came out of the COVID crisis. As we see the signs of the times, we can clearly see that we are entering into this last war. And now is the time to repent and obey the law of God, including the Seventh-day Sabbath on Saturday, as a sign of our rest in the obedience of Jesus Christ as our only hope and as our banner of allegiance to the one true God and his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, for the hour of his judgment is come.